In 2008, with an already illustrious career under her belt, Navi Pele was elected as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. In her six years at the helm of the commission, she briefed the UN Security Council on more occasions than all of her predecessors combined. During her term, she was dubbed as the world's most powerful and effective champion of human rights, made the list of the Forbes 100 most powerful women in the world, and regularly managed to get up the noses of world powers. So the United Nations job, or a gig as the younger people would call it, when did you get wind that you were being considered to be the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights? I had by then served eight and a half years on the Rwanda Tribunal, first as a judge, and then the judges elected me president of that tribunal. Mm -hmm. And from there, I was elected to the International Criminal Court, that's a new court in The Hague, and I was serving on the appeals bench there. I had a six-year term, and this was five years into that term. I uh, heard all around me, everybody seemed to know that I was being headhunted mm -hmm. for the position of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights because the Chinese ambassador came to see me to tell me what to do and not to do as High Commissioner for Human Rights. Yeah, I mustn't talk about certain issues that were not human rights issues and so on, like the Dalai Lama and his authority. And I said to them, you can't come and talk to me about, about all that. I'm, I'm still a judge here. Mm -hmm. And I was probably then shortlisted because I was interviewed by the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to start immediately. I said, on no account will I resign as a judge. No judge does that. Mm -hmm. But he convinced me that it was so important. The member states want the High Commissioner in place because there was a major conference that nobody wanted to touch. And that was the review conference of the Durban Racism Conference. And so it's because of his appeal that I resigned immediately as a judge. But not all of the members of the United Nations were that keen on you getting that job, were they? <laughs> yes, you also heard the rumor. <laughs> well, I, after the event, heard that Condoleezza Rice, on behalf of the U.S., mm -hmm. told the Secretary General that they were objecting to my appointment because of my views on reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our South African law spells out that women have the, the right to decide on reproduction and abortion and so on, whereas the U.S. is a highly funded anti-abortion lobby there. Mm. So she said, I would influence my office with my views. And so the chef de cabinet called me and said that they had given an undertaking to Condoleezza Rice that I would not influence my office with those views. So can I just write a little slip of paper saying that? And they will not use it, they'll just keep it in their drawer. So of course I refused. That's the first of many lessons they learned on how to respect a person who's a judge. Mm. Because later the Secretary General said, now I understand you judges, you stick to your principles. You really wanted to get stuck into what you believed could be really good work done from that office. But you found a United Nations that was quite set in its ways in the 60 years that it had been an organization. And that human rights wasn't something that filtered through all of the different departments and all of the work that they did. How difficult was it for you to almost ensure that human rights are seen alongside things like peace and security and development? It was a huge challenge because you're quite right, that was the setup. The different departments inside the UN worked in their own silos. So those in charge of development will not touch human rights. And those in charge of peace building will not uh, touch these other issues. One didn't know what the other was doing. And I found also in the Human Rights Council that there was a division between the priorities set by developed countries and the priorities of developing countries. Many ambassadors from developing countries came to see me about the fact that the majority of the staff in the office dealing with human rights 
were from Western countries, very few from developing countries. And this would be raised again and again by ambassadors in the Human Rights Council. And I remember at one stage saying, I will not tolerate apartheid in my office. I read uh, in one of the uh, pieces written when you were finishing off, and this piece in The Independent said this was a very sad day because you were leaving. But what I loved is that they said that Dr. Navi Pele, the outgoing United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, is a world-class troublemaker, and boy, are we going to miss her. I heard about that as well, yes. Because it's something that really is the golden thread through your life. It's a positive uh, comment. When you have the power, you have to use it for the benefit of people, right? Nobody else had that power that I had. You know, one ambassador from a very big country in the East said to me, we created a monster here with all these human rights mechanisms. We didn't expect it to go so far. I think every high commissioner has a responsibility and duty to speak up for victim, not only to speak up, to act for change. When I was in Arusha, you know, ordinary people on the road would say two things to me. One, Bafana, Bafana, and the other is Mandela. And they would say, we know you South Africans, you are trustworthy and hardworking. So I feel that I was carrying the flag for our South Africa. We have a certain reputation. And I would have been ashamed if I didn't do my work properly and my fellow South Africans found out. Mm -hmm. You are retired, but very, very busy pensioner by the sounds of it. But I'm sure you keep an eye on what's happening in the country as you do the rest of the world. What do you make of the news that you see coming out of the United States if you see their approach towards uh, refugees and, and asylum seekers, A? And B, here in South Africa, the judiciary is in the headlines almost every single day. People call them the last line of defense what are your thoughts on where we're at as a country, 20 odd years into our democracy, judiciary standing strong by the sounds of it, but almost having to be too active in the political realm? What troubles the whole globe, of course, is the views of Donald Trump, the fact that he withdrew funding for human rights. And everything he does is anti-human rights, pro-racism, pro-prejudice. Previous uh, administrations have done a great deal to support and advance human rights, so that's a sad loss. People are also extremely troubled by the rise of populism and conservatism in Europe. I meet many voters who rush to vote to ensure that the right-wing person doesn't get in. And I'm so inspired that people feel that they have to do something to stop this scourge. Here in South Africa, I feel we're very fortunate. We have uh, the independence of the judiciary, and that means people have access to justice. In most countries, they don't. We have uh, freedom of protest, freedom of expression and assembly, and above all, an independent judiciary. There have been major, major problems with state capture and corruption. This has to be dealt with, and I think it's very hopeful that President Ramaphosa has appointed a very responsible person in charge of national prosecution now. What I see in my country, with pride, is that we are tackling our problems and we're doing something about it. It's not that nothing is happening. We're doing something about it. Everyone has a voice. We criticize the way affirmative action is working. For instance, it's not benefiting the poorest of the poor in South Africa. It's created a rich black elite. Mm. That could never have been intended. It could never have been intended that the constitutional provision about addressing the disadvantage should go along racial lines. It should address the poor across all race groups. So this is what I like about our country. It's vibrant, students are very active. As much as some of them angered us, they burnt the library at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, for instance. But I saw this poster being carried by students saying, do the poor not have the right to education? Which brings me back on why I feel so positive through social media there's awareness of rights. If people can use the rights language, you will win your cases with your politicians and in the courts.